8th spot we have Ian Manuel. In 1990 when Ian Manuel was only 13 years old, he shot a woman in the face blowing out part of her jaw during a robbery. Thankfully she survived but as a result of his crime he was tried and convicted as an adult. As a result he was sentenced to 65 years in prison. He was one of the youngest inmates in the Tampa State Penitentiary. Manuel spent 15 plus years in isolation making him the longest serving inmate in solitary confinement in Florida. Eventually he was released after the woman he shot actually fought for his freedom claiming everyone does dumb things when they're young and she didn't want him to waste his life in jail. At number 9. There is an urban legend that says that the government uses third grade test scores to determine future number of prison beds that will be needed. So basically they believe that there is a correlation with low test scores at this age and the likelihood that they will go to prison. This is actually an urban legend that has been circulating for a long time and a lot of people think that it is true. Well I'm here to clear the air that this is only an urban legend, they actually use fourth grader test scores. Is not third graders. Okay, all jokes aside, I bet they use a very similar strategy to actually predict how many people will be sent to prison each year. It's actually scary to think about it, so let's move on. I don't want to know if someone thinks I'm going to prison. At number eight, we have Martin Bryant. If you're a viewer from Australia, you probably know exactly who this man is. He changed your country for good. Martin Bryant was the madman that performed the worst mass shooting that Australia has ever seen. After that, gun laws were permanently changed. It's super hard to get a gun in Australia. I think you're able to get one for like hunting or something. Or do you guys still hunt with boomerangs over there? <laughs> I'm just kidding. The shooting I'm talking about is of course the Port Arthur massacre where Bryant shot and killed 35 people. On top of that he kidnapped someone, stole a car and injured 23 other people. This guy was on a rampage and watching him talk about his mental space while he was doing this makes your skin crawl. For all his horrible crimes he was sentenced to 1035 years in in prison. And as I mentioned before, Australia had a massive overhaul on all their gun laws. The country has like never been the same since then. Well, when it comes to guns. And now at number seven, we have Timothy McVeigh. He infamously said, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. If you guys remember, he was the one behind the Oklahoma City bombing, which killed 168 people and injured over 680 others. This bombing is actually the deadliest act of domestic terrorism in the United States. His execution date was set for June 11, 2001 and he made a request to have it publicly televised but this motion was denied. He invited a composer to perform classical music on the night of his execution and he requested to have a Catholic chaplain. He also requested two pints of mint chocolate chip ice cream as his last meal. He was executed by lethal injection and his wait to be executed was way shorter than most inmates waiting on death row. He only spent about four years on death row, while most inmates spend an average of 15 years. Now on the number 6, Steven Slevin. After being charged with drunk driving, New Mexico officials put Slevin in solitary confinement because of his history with mental illness, as per an official lawsuit. After spending 22 months in a cell all alone, Slevin was released and would go on to sue New Mexico, being awarded $15.5 million. As per the lawsuit, Slevin went to jail when he was 59 in 2005 and was well nourished and a physically healthy adult. However, as per reports, when he was released, he had a long beard, bed sores, bad teeth and weighed just 133 pounds in June of 2007. Slevin wasn't even charged or prosecuted with his drunk driving and stolen vehicle charges and as per his civil rights attorney Matthew Coit, I quote, they threw him in solitary and then ignored him. He disappeared into delirium and his mental illness was made worse by being isolated from human contact and a lack of medical care. At one point it's believed he had to pull his own rotting tooth and that all his pleas for help were ignored. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with John Massey. In 1975, John Massey got into a fight with a pub's bouncer and he shot him in the chest. At the age of 26, he was sentenced to life for murder. But while in prison, Massey managed to successfully escape three times. His most notorious escape was when he made a makeshift rope out of sheets and a pair of heavy duty gloves to climb over the prison wall. As a result of his escapes, he was placed in solitary confinement. He was allowed 15 minutes outside of his cell each day and had only 8 minutes for a phone call. Other than that, he was kept locked away. 
He is considered one of Britain's longest serving prisoners. He was eventually released after spending nearly 43 years behind bars. The Russian sleep experiment comes onto our list at number 4. Alright guys, prepare yourselves because this urban legend is pretty its pretty brutal. Let me take you guys back to the 1940s, where Russian researchers wanted to conduct an experiment. They wanted to see what the effects were if you deprived yourself of sleep. Why? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but due to ethical reasons, they didn't want to pick any volunteers off the street. They decided to force 5 prisoners to participate in this experiment. Yeah, that's that's so ethical. The prisons were given an experimental gas that would prevent them from sleeping. Their conservations were recorded and monitored through video cameras and a two way mirror. This is just so mean. Well, for the first few days, everything was fine, the prisoners were behaving normally, but on the fifth day, things got really bad. The prisoners became paranoid and started whispering about each other in the microphones. Eventually, the prisoners were running around, screaming, and almost breaking their vocal cords. On the fifth day, the experimenters decided to put in fresh air instead of harmful gas, but that just made things even worse. One prisoner died and the other severely mutilated their bodies. They tore off their flesh, ripped out their abdomen and muscles as well. When the researchers came to remove them from the room, the prisoners refused and they wanted to be locked up forever. Eventually all of the prisoners were shot and killed because they wanted to cover up this highly unethical experiment. Now many people claim that this is only an urban legend and it shouldn't be taken seriously, but I think there's a chance of it being real. I mean, there are so many experiments that humans have done in the past that would be totally illegal today, which is why people want to keep it hidden. At number three, we have Ram Yusuf. This man is a notorious terrorist who planned several attacks on America. He planned a terrorist attack against the World Trade Center back in 1993, where one of his underlings drove a truck filled with explosives into the base of the tower. This was a relatively small attack, only six people were killed, which is still terrible, but not as horrible when you learn that his uncle was behind the September 11th attacks. I guess terrorism runs in the family. After he was arrested, he was quickly tried and is now serving two consecutive life sentences. Carl Panzram's last words makes it onto this list at number two. You probably don't recognize his name, but he is actually known as one of the most sadistic American serial killers of all time. He had more than a dozen aliases, and no one knew anything about what he has done for years until until he was captured in November 1928. Before his death, he confessed to killing 21 people and sexually harming all 1,000 males. Is this real life right now? And right before he was hanged, he said, In my lifetime, I have murdered 21 human beings. I have committed thousands of burglaries, robberies, larcenies, arsons, and last but not least, I have committed sodomy on more than 1,000 male human beings. That is just sickening. And for all those reasons, I'm not the least Bit sorry for this guy. And finally, at number one is Jesse Pomeroy. Born in 1859, Jesse was a convicted murderer and the youngest person in Massachusetts to ever have been convicted of first degree murder. He targeted boys, and so a lot of them ended up dead, as you can imagine. If you've seen The Alienist, the bad guy in that was based off him. And I watched that, and that was messed up. He was pronounced guilty in 1874 and also sentenced to death, but the death warrant was never signed. The council voted several times to have Governor Gaston sign the warrant, but he never did, and so the death penalty was changed to him serving out his sentence in solitary confinement. In 1876, he was transferred to the state prison in Charleston, where he was sent to solitary at the age of 16. He apparently taught himself to read many languages in that time, like Hebrew, he wrote poetry, studied law, and tried to escape 10 to 12 times, so confinement was quite productive for Jesse. He even lost an eye after trying to destroy one side of his cell with a gas pipe. In 1917, he was finally allowed to join the rest of the jail, and later died in 1932 from old age. Haunting us in at number 10, we have Idaho's scariest ghost. Raymond Allen Snowden used to be referred to as Idaho's Jack the Ripper because he brutally slayed a woman while he was out on a date with her and he showed absolutely no remorse. He slashed her throat and stabbed her skull, severing her spinal cord. If that wasn't brutal enough, the corpse also had 30 stab wounds all over her body. He even bragged about murdering her while he was locked up. He was sentenced to death by hanging, but when it came time for his execution, his neck didn't snap properly and he spent 15 minutes gasping for air before he finally died. According to this urban legend, if you visit Idaho State Penitentiary, you can 
hear someone gasping for air and strange things have occurred at this prison that no one is able to explain. Seems like this prison needs some sage or holy water, you know, get rid of this ghost. Private prisons use third grade test scores to plan for prison beds and this makes it onto our list. Moving up this list with George Engel in at number 9. He was an anarchist who didn't like to follow any sort of rules or regulations. He was involved with a lot of activism and protests in the Chicago area. A protest bombing took place in Haymarket Square in Chicago that resulted in the death of 7 police officers, 4 civilians and a lot of other people who were seriously injured. George Engel was actually at home playing cards while this riot broke out and he was arrested the next day and charged with conspiracy in the bombings. He was convicted and sentenced to hanging but before he took his last breath he said hurrah for anarchy this is the happiest moment of my life. Roger Keith Coleman makes his last statement in at number 8. His case gained a nationwide attention and major controversy because he maintained his innocence the whole time during his conviction and even right before he was executed. During during his final last words, he said, An innocent man is going to be murdered tonight. When my innocence is proven, I hope Americans will realize the injustice of the death penalty as all other civilized countries have. He was convicted in Virginia for assaulting and murdering his sister-in-law on the day that he has been laid off from work. After his death, the DNA evidence was reanalyzed and in January 2006, the governor announced that the testing of the DNA evidence has conclusively proven that he was guilty of the crime. Ok that's great and all but why don't you think you should have done a thousand tests on the DNA before you executed him? It makes no sense. What if the DNA evidence proved that he wasn't guilty? What would the press conference look like then? Oops we made a massive mistake and killed an innocent man. My bad. In our 7th spot we have Ian Brady. Between 1963 and 1965, Ian Brady and his accomplice tortured, abused, and killed five individuals. They would bury their bodies on the moors outside of Manchester, which gave them the name the Moors Murderers. The crimes they committed were horrific, and Brady expressed no remorse. As a result, he was held in solitary confinement. His only contact with the outside world was through letters. It's said that on his free time he would memorize whole pages of Shakespeare and Plato and then recite them to himself. He would also often interact with television programs. Brady died in prison on May 15, 2017 at the age of 79. At number 6 we have Charles Scott Robinson. I'm going to do a brief breakdown of this man's crimes because they are very disturbing. If you want to know more about this grotesque man you can obviously look him up but I would suggest against that. Just take my word for it when I say he's a horrible person. Charles Scott Robinson was convicted of 6 counts of sexual assault against a 3 year old girl in an Oklahoma courtroom. Every breakdown of his charges will make your stomach turn. It was one of the most open and shut cases ever in Oklahoma state history. It took the jury only 35 minutes to decide his fate. Now they couldn't give him life in prison because of Oklahoma state law, but there was no way that the people there were going to let this monster think he was going to see the light of day again. So for each one of his 6 charges, the judge issued 5,000 years in prison. We'll see this guy running loose after the sun explodes. Coming in at number 5 is Adam Capay. 23 year old First Nations man Adam Capay was moved to solitary confinement back in 2012 after killing another inmate during a fight. Adam is in this plexiglass lined cell at Thunder Bay jail for 24 hours a day just rotting under the artificial light. He spent 4 years in isolation but the community safety minister David Orazietti refuses to let him join the rest of the prison again. Adam has been alone for 4 years and still hasn't had his trial yet which is ridiculous. He is one one example of the thousands of prisoners in Ontario that spend more than two weeks in solitary confinement and get forgotten about. His case actually came to light after a prison guard tipped off the head of Ontario's Human Rights Commission, Renu Mandhane. She went to visit the jail and found him alone in the corner of his room after being in there for nearly 1500 days. He had major memory loss, he couldn't speak and because of the fake light he couldn't tell when it was night or day. Mr Orazietti still refused to release him even after her pleas. In our fourth spot we have Thomas Silverstein. Thomas Edward Silverstein was an American criminal jailed for armed robbery in 1978. But while in prison he committed numerous other crimes. In 1983 he killed a prison officer who he stabbed multiple times. Then he murdered two inmates. 
As a result, he had to be detained in a specially designed cell at the ADX Florence Federal Penitentiary in Colorado. Due to the crimes he committed while in jail, he is considered the most violent prisoner in America. He is also referred to as America's most isolated man. Now, Silverstein was considered so dangerous that he got transferred to a federal prison in Atlanta. There he was confined in a 6 by 7 foot cell. He was constantly under surveillance, in fact the lights in his cell were never turned off so that they could always keep an eye on him. Silverstein eventually died in prison at the age of 67. He is said to have served the longest term in solitary confinement in the federal penitentiary system. Shepton Mallet Prison brings us to number 3. This prison has some pr Pretty intense people locked up behind bars. People such as child killers, rapists, and gangsters wrecked havoc here until they were either executed or their prison shut down. There was a ton of murderers and suicides that happened here, and this is why this prison is known to have a lot of angry and vengeful ghosts. This urban legend says that if you visit this old haunted prison, an old prison ghost will follow you home and haunt you for the rest of your life. So yeah, I don't think I'd be willing to take that risk. Imagine if the child killer followed you home. I, I mean, no thanks. I think this prison should be burned to the ground or at least have a priest bless this prison. At number two, we have Jamal Zuga. This man is one of the ringleaders behind the most savage terrorist attack that has ever hit Spain. Jamal, with the help of two other terrorists, managed to plant bombs in a subway car in Madrid. These exploded, killing 192 people and injuring several others. This shocked the entire nation with a massive manhunt sent out to find Find out who was responsible. Eventually, they tracked down the culprits, and after the trial, Jamal was sentenced to 42,922 years in prison. His two henchmen also received similar sentences to rack up the total years between all of them to be over 100,000 years in prison. Shouldn't they just say, like, forever? Like, no more chances, do not pass go, do not collect $200, or going away forever, dude? The Vampire of Dusseldorf falls onto our list at number one. He is known as a vampire because he would occasionally attempt to drink the blood from his victims wounds while they were still alive. But eventually he was arrested and sentenced to death by beheading because he committed a series of murders and sexual assaults. He even admitted to killing a 9 year old girl. It is confirmed that he murdered at least 9 people but the police suspected that he brutally murdered a lot more people. So one evening before his death he ordered a wiener schnitzel, a bottle of white wine and fried potatoes and the next morning he was taken to the guillotine to have his head chopped chopped off. But before he left this world, he made one last scary statement that probably haunted the people that were at his execution. He said, tell me, after my head has been chopped off, will I still be able to hear, at least for a moment, the sound of my own blood gushing from the stump of my head? That would be a pleasure to end all pleasures. I mean, yeah, after hearing that, I'm definitely going to have nightmares. And if that wasn't enough, his mummified head is on display right now in a Wisconsin Museum after doctors tried to cut it open to find reasons behind his evil. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Starting our list off at number 10, Daniel Chong. The 25 year old UCSD student was detained the morning of April 21st, 2012, while visiting a friend's house. Turns out the house was suspected of being a distribution center for narcotics, and when DEA agents stormed the residence, they found exactly what they were suspecting. Detaining a total of nine people and seizing thousands of pills, both prescription and recreational, as well as tons of guns and ammo, it seems Chong was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He genuinely had no clue about any of the business taking place, and when he was detained, they threw him in a cell without charging him and actually forgetting about him for days. Being held in a 5 by 10 foot cell with no toilet, a pee hole through the door, and a metal bench, Chong was literally kicking and screaming for someone while handcuffed and fighting for his life. Even though he heard footsteps and voices from nearby cells, no one came to check on the innocent man until April 25th. By then, Chong had already drunk his own urine and caved sorry mom into his arm using shards of glass from his glasses, a way of giving her a final goodbye. Thankfully, he was released and never charged, but would end up losing 15 pounds and suffered from PTSD. Chong would go on to sue the DEA and would settle with a deal seeing the man receive $4.1 million from the agency. 
Moving on at number nine, we have Jesse Pomeroy. Jesse Pomeroy, otherwise known as the Boston Boy Fiend or the Boy Torturer, was convicted of countless murders at the age of 14 in 1875. He would abuse, torture, and then kill his victims. In fact, he was the youngest person in the history of Massachusetts to be convicted of first degree murder. When Jesse was caught, he admitted to the murders and was sentenced to live in the Westboro Boys Reform School until he was 18. However, while at the school, he went on to commit other murders. That's when he was sentenced to prison and was placed in solitary confinement. His only interactions were with his guard and his mom, who would visit him once a month. Things get pretty intense in at number 8. We have this urban legend of a Lavinia Fisher. According to this legend, she is known as America's first female serial killer. Lavinia and her husband ran a bed and breakfast just north of Charleston, and this is where a lot of travelers would stop into to get some rest. Little did they know that Lavinia would serve poison tea to her victims in order to rob them of of their possessions. She would lure wealthy men into a room and serve them this poison tea. She would suggest that they would get some rest on a particular bed that had a trap door beneath it. When the victim would pass out, she pulled a lever, causing their bodies to just fall into the pit below the house. One night a man stopped at this bed and breakfast for some rest and he was invited to have some tea. He really didn't like the tea, but he was too polite to refuse. When Lavia wasn't looking, he dumped his tea in the plant next to him. Him, so she thought he drank it. He felt that she was acting strange, so he decided to leave and go back to his room. Lavinia thought he drank the poison tea, so when she went into his room to rob him and drop his body into the pit, he was stunned to learn what her real motives were. He was able to escape and report the whole thing. The Fishers were executed in 1820, and according to the local legend, her spirit haunts the Charleston jail where she was hanged. At number seven, we have Dwight York. This man was a cult leader in New York City, a great place to find crazies to follow a cause. He made up his own belief system that he took from several other religions, and like most cult leaders, he wanted to make his own country. So far this guy seems kind of harmless, until you learn that he was preaching hatred towards other ethnicities and he also molested children. Like most cult leaders, this guy was a horrible person. Once he was caught, he was put on trial and admitted to everything which made for a quick sentence. He was given 137 years in prison. So I I think his religion is dead now. The infamous Jeffrey Dahmer is next up at number 6. He was sentenced to 15 consecutive life terms for murdering 17 men and boys in the Milwaukee area and this is between 1978 and 1991. He was also heavily into necrophilia and he kept his victims body parts in the freezer so that he can, um, he can just eat them later. The interesting part of this story is that Jeffrey Dahmer wasn't given the death penalty. His inmate actually beat him to death because he said that that Jeffrey Dahmer was a sick and creepy man. And yeah, he, he was. He used to make this person food look like human body parts and he would cover them in ketchup to resemble blood. So according to Jeffrey Dahmer's murderer, his last words were, I don't care if I live or die, go ahead and kill me. And now at number five, we have the Wyoming Territorial Prison. This one is pretty creepy. This prison is known to be a hotspot for paranormal and unexplained occurrences. During its 80 year run, the prison housed some of the most violent and sadistic criminals who ever walked the planet. One of them was a very young inmate named Andrew Pickley, who was a child serial killer and cannibal who was executed in the 1960s. After it was closed, the prison became a huge tourist attraction because there are mainly ghost urban legends that surround this prison. Lots of people claim that they can hear Andrew's creepy voice screaming about wanting to eat human flesh and how he wants to mutilate your body. Some other visitors also claimed that they feel cold spots and a spooky feeling that something bad is gonna happen. John Wayne Gacy had three famous last words and this comes into number four. He kept it short and sweet when he said, kiss my ass. I don't know about you guys, but I think I would have, you know, a lot more to say for my final words than kiss my ass. But then again, he was a textbook serial killer who didn't really have any emotions. He was known as the killer clown because he used to dress up as Pogo the Clown and perform at 
many charitable events and birthday parties. He took the lives of at least 33 young boys in Illinois and he would bury their bodies underneath his home. So when he was convicted of sexual assault in 1968, the police were able to find all of the dead bodies that he tried to cover up. Despite a bunch of corpse being found underneath his own home, he maintained his innocence. But he was found guilty in 1980 because there was just so much compelling evidence against him. He was given multiple death penalties and life sentences and finally, after being on death row for 14 years, he was executed by lethal injection. Coming in at number 3 we have Gary Ridgway, also known as the Green River Killer. This monster of a man was convicted of 49 separate murders. His victims consisted of women of all ages, most being sex workers. He would strangle and dump their bodies in forested areas before coming back later on and having intercourse with their dead bodies. In November of 2001, Gary was arrested at work for murdering these women nearly 20 years prior. He was sentenced to 48 life sentences with no possibilities of parole and one life sentence on top of that. A further 10 years was added since he tampered with evidence, making his total time 480 years on top of the 48 life sentences he already had. That's like so many people's lifetimes. In January of 2004, he was moved to solitary confinement at Washington State Penitentiary, and that's where he still is. Moving on to number two, we have Elizabeth Bathory. Elizabeth Bathory, otherwise known as the Countess Who Bathed in Blood, was a serial killer in Hungary back in the 16th century. It's believed that she had killed around 650 girls. She's also considered the most vicious female serial killer in all recorded history. It's believed that her husband was a big influence in her killings. Apparently, he told her to torture her servants. He said for her to pour honey all over them and then let the bugs eat them. But her killings didn't truly start until she met a witch named Anna Darvula. This witch told Elizabeth that bathing in the blood of the young would help her maintain her youth. And that's exactly what she would do. Eventually, Elizabeth was sentenced to life in solitary confinement. She was locked up in her castle's torture chamber. The windows and doors were boarded up with her inside. There was only a small hole in which food was passed in through. On August 21st, 1611, she passed away. The infamous Alcatraz prison scares us in at number one. This is recognized as the most notorious prison in the entire world. I actually visited the prison a few years back and it, it's pretty scary. And you can definitely sense evil within the prison walls, although the prison has a lot of paranormal activity and a ton of urban legends, I want to talk about cell 14D. This cell was used to brutally punish prisoners who got out of line. The prisoners would be kept in the small cell with a toilet, sink, there'd be only one light bulb on, and a mattress that was only given to them at night time. There were several of these punishment cells, but cell 14D had very active spirits. People who visited this cell reported a raw coldness, and they feel a sudden evil force. Prisoners locked in cell 14D screamed throughout the night, and they have all said that they saw a creature with glowing red eyes. One prisoner who screamed that he was being killed by this demon ghost, well he was actually found the next morning strangled to death and he also had unexplainable marks all over his body. The prison guards are claiming that this is only an urban legend, but what if it's just a big cover up for the way the prison guards mistreated their inmates? Maybe a prison guard killed this prisoner and made up this entire urban legend. At number 10 we have Terry Nichols. Terry Nichols and Timothy McVeigh were responsible for the largest domestic terrorist attack in American history. The two parked a truck that was rigged with explosives, then drove it into a parking garage of a downtown building and detonated it. The explosion killed 168 people and injured 60 more. It was a massive explosion that shredded the three story building. The ripples of the explosion flew through the city, shattering windows of the nearby buildings, which led to even more injuries and over 600 million dollars in damages. These guys were not messing around at all. This was a massive attack. It didn't take long for Nichols to get caught and once they had him in custody, they were able to link him back to the crime with DNA evidence. The trial was short and after everything was said and done, Nichols received 161 consecutive life
life sentences. So it's safe to say that he's going to die in jail. It's always cases like this that make me wonder how intelligent someone needs to be to pull off something like this. And what good they could have created if they chose to go down a different path with their life. Coming in at number 9 is Frank De Palma. On the 3rd of February 1992, Frank was sent to solitary confinement just so he could be kept away from the young gang members arriving at the Eli Maximum Security Prison. He was imprisoned for 42 years and 9 months and he spent 22 of those in solitary confinement. Frank said he never once stepped out of his cell in the last 5 years of it. It got to a point that any time he was taking it into the yard he started to panic because of all the open space and wouldn't be fine again till he was back in his cell. Frank developed agoraphobia. He started to divorce himself from all the people he used to know and the memories he had and started living in an imaginary world. On the 11th of March 2014, a warden and psychologist visited him because they realised he would be released soon otherwise he was 100% sure they had forgotten he was even in there. By the time he was finally moved to another correct Center, Frank said he couldn't feel anything. He couldn't even speak since he hadn't done so in so long, and it actually took him a total of seven hours just to come out of his cell. He was finally released on the 21st of December 2018. Moving on to number nine, we have Jesse Pomeroy. Jesse Pomeroy, otherwise known as the Boston Boy Fiend or the Boy Torturer, was convicted of countless murders at the age of 14 in 1875. He would abuse, torture, and then kill his victims. In fact, he was the youngest person in the history of Massachusetts to be convicted of first degree murder. When Jesse was caught, he admitted to the murders and was sentenced to live in the Westboro Boys Reform School until he was 18. However, while at the school, he went on to commit other murders. That's when he was sentenced to prison and was placed in solitary confinement. His only interactions were with his guard and his mom, who would visit him once a month. Sliding into our number 7 slot is Robert King. Robert and Albert, who Jared just mentioned, were part of the Angola 3 along with Herman Wallace. They were put in solitary confinement at Angola prison for decades. Robert was initially incarcerated for armed robbery. While in prison, he was convicted of a prison murder back in 1973 and was put in solitary confinement for 29 years before his conviction was overturned. So of the 32 full years he spent in jail, only 3 of them weren't in solitude. In 2001, a new trial was ordered for his case and he was indicted yet again but King decided to accept a plea deal for lower charges instead of serving more time. He was released the following year. Moving into number 6, we're talking about Cripple Creek Jail. I mean whoa, with a name like that, no wonder this prison is haunted and it has a creepy urban legend. If I was a ghost, that would be a prison I would want to haunt. But seriously, who's in charge of naming this building? This poorly named jailhouse was opened in 1901 and it was in operation for almost 100 years. Only one prisoner was known to die within the jail walls after he fell from a second floor catwalk. After his death, there have been strange paranormal activities that no one can explain. People have heard heavy footsteps going up and down the wind staircase. There is a ghost child who can always be seen roaming the hallways looking for her parents, but the scariest urban legend is about the dead prisoner's cell. It is reported that if you walk past this cell, you can feel a hand reach out and grab you. Some people have even said that they felt their hair being pulled and they felt someone breathing heavily on their neck. At number 5 we have Ivan Millet. If you ever seen the movie Wolf Creek, it's all about this man. He was given the name the Backpack murderer because he would target backpackers out in the wilderness. The first time he was ever put on trial was back in 1971. This twisted psychopath raped two girls with a knife and was able to walk because they couldn't link the crimes back to him. After that he went quiet, but in 1989 the burnt bodies of some foreign backpackers were discovered. They couldn't link the case to anyone, but for the next four years, five other people killed and burned in similar ways would pop up. Eventually the police caught up with Millet. They pushed him to confess for his crimes, but he never let out a peep about what he did. After everything was said and done, he was sentenced to seven consecutive life sentences in 1996. He has been serving his time in jail but recently fell ill with stomach cancer and esophagus cancer. It seems that he was going to die very soon and the police attempted once again to get him to admit to his crimes, just to give peace of mind to the victims and their families. But again, he refused. He died on October 27, 2019. I know this is a list of people living out their sentences but this guy 
just died. And it was an interesting one, so I wanted to include it on the list. Also, the movie's all right. On to number four, Jerry Hartfield. In 1976, Hartfield was arrested after his fingerprints were found on a Dr. Pepper bottle located where a woman was assaulted and murdered. Although he confessed to the crime, he admits he was coerced into doing so. And given the fact that he was a black man in the South in the 70s with an IQ of 50 or 60, well, let's just say he wasn't given much of a chance from the start. It wouldn't be long before he would be sentenced to death. However, four years later, he would be requested to have a retrial after one of the jurors' issues with the death penalty was overlooked. Instead of giving the man a retrial, prosecutors in Texas tried to change his sentence to a life sentence, but after three years, he would be issued a retrial. Prior to this, however, the governor decided he would change the sentence himself, avoiding a trial. The judges pushing for a retrial thought the prosecution was taking over from that point, and the governor's office thought the case was closed. In a sense, everyone thought someone else was handling the case, but that just led to a lot of miscommunication and years of Hartfield's life that he spent in prison. In 2006, he realized someone made a mistake after 23 more years locked up and decided to do something about it. When all was said and done, the state tried blaming Hartfield for not bringing their mistake to light from 1983 until 2006. However, from 2006 until 2013, when he pushed for a review of his case, his lawyers made a strong enough case that the state agreed with, claiming his speedy trial rights had been violated. This led to his release only after his lawyers appealed the court's initial decision in 2015 to sentence him to life in prison for a crime he seemingly didn't even commit. Coming in at number three, we have Eileen Wernos. Eileen Wernos, often referred to as the damsel of death, was found guilty of killing seven men. She claimed it was self defense, but then later pleaded guilty to the murders. She would murder them, rob them, and then drive home in their cars. Due to this, she was named America's first female serial killer. Now, Eileen was placed in solitary confinement for quite some time. But then she started to grow paranoid. She thought that the people making her food were spitting in it. And then she also claimed that she was being attacked by a sonic weapon. As a result, she wanted the court to hurry up with her death sentence. On October 9th, 2002, Eileen died by lethal injection. Our next prisoner of a legend brings us to the Eastern State Penitentiary, and this takes us to number two. This prison was one of the most expensive buildings built in the US, and it was going to be used as a prototype to build 300 other prisons. The facility was operated by a corrupt company who opened up the prison doors to people who wanted to lock themselves up in order to find God. These people might have been under the impression that they're going to find God, but they were literally placed in hell. They had to live in complete solitude and silence, and if they broke any of the rules, they would have to face severe punishments, such as the mad chair, where they would be strapped so tightly to a chair, it was impossible for them to move. They would sit there for days without food, and eventually they would go insane. So apart from the prison being a nightmare, there's an urban legend about a locksmith who was doing some repairs on cell block number four. He was hired to remove a very old lock from the cell door, but as he was working, he felt a massive force overcome him where he had an outer body experience. He said that this lock is the gateway to some place evil and anyone who dares remove it will experience terrible things. To this day, that lock remains there because people are absolutely terrified of the consequences. And for our number one spot, we have Ted Kaczynski. This is one of the most famous investigations in history. It has gone down as the most expensive case that the FBI has ever undergone. Ted Kaczynski was insane, but also a genius. He had a bachelor's from Harvard and a master's and a PhD from the University of Michigan. Before his life of crime, he was known for his incredible intellect and aptitude with mathematics. Due to his disdain for modern society, he abandoned city life and went to live as a recluse in the woods. This was back in 1969. He was teaching himself how to live off the land. Because of the continuous expansion of technology, he found the changing world impossible to ignore and decided to turn to a life of crime. In 1978, he began to send out packaged bombs to universities and airlines. He was active for nearly two decades and in this time he killed three people and injured 23 others. From him continuously targeting universities and airlines, the FBI had him under the codename UA Bomb, as in University Airline Bomber which the media then turned into the Unabomber. Eventually, he sent out a manifesto to the New York Times demanding that they publish it or he would bomb another airline. They did publish Ted's manifesto, but this would be his undoing. His brother recognized his handwriting and gave his location to the FBI. Now he's serving eight consecutive life sentences. Starting things off, in number 10, we have Robert Elton Harris. He said, you can be a king or a street sweeper, but everyone dances with the Grim Reaper. He was arrested on July 5th in 1978 when him and his brother hijacked a car with two teenage boys in it. They ordered them to drive to a remote location where the brothers brutally murdered
murder them and then they used the vehicle as a getaway car when they robbed a San Diego bank. Robert Harris was arrested just one hour after the robbery and he was charged with murder and auto theft, kidnapping, burglary, and bank robbery. One of the arresting officers was the father of one of the murdered boys, but he didn't realize that the victim was his son until later. He wasn't even able to recognize his son's face, that's how violent the murder was. Robert Harris was sentenced to death in 1979. After many appeals, he was finally executed in San Quentin's gas chamber on April 21st, 1992. We have Thomas Silverstein. This guy has a rap sheet a mile long. He has been arrested for robbery, theft, vandalism, attempted murder, and of course, regular murder. The case that got him locked up for good was when he stabbed a man over 60 times. Since then, he's been bounced around to a few different prisons in America, and he's considered one of the most dangerous men in the American prison system. I would think once you're in prison, you would stop committing crimes, but not Silverstein. Some people don't want to stop once they're on a roll. Since this guy's been locked up, he's murdered two inmates and a guard, now he's locked in solitary confinement, probably for good. If you can't play well with others, you don't get to hang out with the other kids. He's fighting back against his forced solitary lifestyle. He's filed a case against the Federal Bureau of Prisoners. He considers the conditions he's forced to live in torture. But dude, what do you expect? When you hang out with other people, you kill them. Now on to number 8, Albert Woodfox. This man would serve more than 40 years in solitary confinement for a murder he says he didn't commit. In fact, Woodfox believes he was framed for the murder of a prison guard simply because he was a part of the Black Panther political party. Originally arrested in 1971 at just 22 years old for armed robbery, Woodfox would be sentenced to 50 years in Angola prison, which was at the time known for being one of the worst in North America. That's where he joined the Black Panthers as he recalls the disgusting conditions the prison allowed and wanted to make a change. Unfortunately, he would be accused of murdering a guard named Brent Miller in 1972, along with fellow inmate Herman Wallace, even though there was no physical evidence linking the men to the crime. Aside from this, his conviction of the murder would be overturned twice, and finally in 2016, after accepting a plea deal to lesser charges, he would be released. To this day, the man is maintaining his innocence and made it clear that him accepting the deal wasn't an admission to guilt, but cited his age and health as the reason behind his decision. Things get even more spooky in at number 7 with the Montana Territorial Prison. This was a prison that was operational in the late 1800s. However, due to lack of funding and exceeding capacity, the prison quickly became overcrowded and violent. The prisoners were basically starving to death and they were crammed into small spaces that they began to show extreme violent behaviors. A lot of the prisoners committed suicide and even killed each other. Because the prison was so underfunded, it remained in a dirty and rundown state for over a century until a massive riot broke out and the prisoners took control for a whole day in 1959. The prison was shut down in 1976 but visitors claim that they have heard voices, footsteps and scary sounds lurking working through the abandoned halls. Some people even say that they can feel ghosts touching them or there have been ghosts pushing people. Apparently you can also feel a sense of impending doom and you feel like you're always going to be attacked. Well, if I were to ever plan a trip to Idaho, I don't think I'm going to this prison for any tour anytime soon. I think I would rather spend my time eating Idaho potatoes instead of being attacked by scary prison ghosts. But that's just me. Making our way down the list, number six, we have Dennis Ratter. Between the years of 1974 to 1991, American serial killer Dennis Ratter took the lives of 10 individuals. In 2005, he was convicted for his crimes, and now he's facing 100 in 75 years in solitary confinement without the possibility of parole. Now, Dennis likes to go by the name BTK or the BTK Strangler, which stands for bind him, torture him, and kill him. So that says a lot about who this guy is. But thankfully, he is locked away and has no chance of escaping. To this day, Dennis is considered one of the most diabolical serial killers in American history. And now at number 5 we have Tom Blackjack Ketchum. He was an outlawed cowboy who murdered someone in 1895. After that, his gang fled to New Mexico where they committed more robberies before he was captured during an unsuccessful attempt to rob a train. He was quickly arrested, put on trial, found guilty, and sentenced to death by hanging. 
hanging. When his execution date arrived, it was the biggest public display in the area because he was the first person to be hanged for a train robbery in New Mexico. However, things didn't go as smoothly as they hoped. Before he was hanged, he said this, I'll be in hell before you start breakfast boys, let her rip. And right after that he said the rope completely decapitated him and it is said that his headless body landed on its feet and stayed standing upright for quite some time. At number 4 we have Gary Ridgway. This man is one of the most famous American serial killers ever. He was active throughout the 80s and 90s in Washington and it's thought that he was responsible for the deaths of up to 71 women. He would prey on women who were in struggling circumstances, mainly women involved in sex work or teenage girls who had run away from home. He would normally kill them through strangulation, sometimes using his hands, other times using a rope or a belt tied around their neck. After he killed his victims, he would dump their bodies in wooded areas. This is so he could come back and have sex with their dead bodies later. Some of his victims were also disposed of in the Green River and that's how he got his nickname the Green River Killer. Five of the bodies were found in the Green River before he was caught and the press coined that nickname for him before they had any idea of his identity. After he had been tried he was sentenced to 41 consecutive life sentences and 480 years on top of that. He is now 70 years old and rotting in prison. Aileen Warrenos is up next at number 3. Aileen had a terrible childhood that was full of abuse and abandonment so it's almost no surprise that she went on a killing rampage that would define her as America's most infamous female serial killer. She worked as a prostitute and she killed seven men that picked her up along the highway. Aileen said that all of her murderers were out of self defense but she was also convicted and sentenced to death for six of the murders. She was executed by lethal injection on October 9, 2002 but before she died she said this, I just like to say I'm sailing with the rock and I'll be back like Independence Day with Jesus June the 6th. Like the movie A Big Mothership of All, I'll be back. I don't even know what this even means but I am pretty scared. And uh, June 6th, what happens on June 6th? On the number 2 Destiny Hoffman, originally supposed to serve just 48 hours total in jail, Hoffman would end up spending 154 days there after a judge seemingly forgot to issue her release order. On August 22nd, Clark County Circuit Court Judge Jerry Jacoby ordered Hoffman to be held without bond until further order of the court. The only issue is he totally forgot about that order until 5 months later. Apparently she was jailed without legal counsel or a hearing which as far as I'm concerned is against her rights as an American. She was arrested after diluting her drug test which was a violation of her original court order program. No one is sure why she didn't speak up about her sentence exceeding the 48 hour period and it seems the only reason she was released is because a prosecutor reviewing old files noticed something didn't add up. Upon requesting an immediate update on the situation, Hoffman would be released. She has since filed the civil suit but I could not speak on the outcome of that. And in our number one spot we have Robert Maudsley. Now I've talked about Robert in my other video on dangerous criminals and there's no way that I couldn't include him on this list. Robert Maudsley is considered Britain's most dangerous prisoner. Maudsley was originally convicted for one murder, however killed three more individuals in prison which got him placed in solitary confinement. In 1977, Maudsley and his fellow inmate held another prisoner hostage. They ended up torturing him for 9 hours before cracking his head open and killing him. Now it's rumored that he may have ate some of that prisoner's brain. As a result, he was deemed the real life Hannibal Lecter. After that, he murdered 2 more inmates which got him placed in solitary confinement. In fact, he is locked up in a glass cell underneath Wakefield Jail. He spends 23 hours of his day there. 